Good evening and welcome. I'm Nora Kane. I'm the director of the Stanford Health Library. And it's my pleasure to welcome you again tonight to one of our great community lecture series. Um, this is one of our Living Better series, which has been a wonderful success uh, with Dr. Randall Stafford and Leah Gropo. Um, tonight, we're discussing uh, Living Better with Type 2 Diabetes. And uh, it looks like it's going to be a very interesting and salient topic for tonight. So. I'm going to let Dr. Stafford take it and do his own introduction, and then he will introduce Leah Grupo, our dietitian, who is also going to be contributing a lot to tonight's discussion. So um, with that, I'm just going to turn the, the screen over to Dr. Randall Stafford. Hi there. Welcome, everybody. It's uh, great to have you with us tonight. I'm going to actually have... Uh, my colleague, Leah Gropo, uh, go ahead and introduce herself, and I'll talk to you in just a minute. Everybody, my name is Leah Gropo. I'm a registered dietitian um, and I specialize in diabetes education. I work in the Stanford Endocrinology Clinic um, and I also am fortunate enough to teach classes and work out of primary care. So this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart um, and I hope that you enjoy um, this conversation we're going to have tonight. Yeah, thanks, Leah. So my name's Randall Stafford. I'm a uh, primary care physician and researcher within uh, the Stanford Department of Medicine. And uh, this series, um, Living Better with Chronic Disease, really came out of some ideas around how we can get patients to be part of the care process, how we can teach patients how to better understand their conditions and really be part of the treatment with this idea of, of self-management. Diabetes is a really important topic. It's uh, a disease that affects a lot of people in this country. And uh, we feel like this is a, a good topic to take through this idea that we can teach people to live better with a chronic disease. And while there are so many aspects of diabetes, we're gonna be specifically focusing on this idea of living better and how people can take some control of their health and their health care uh, to have better outcomes with diabetes. So in terms of introducing myself, uh, you know, I am a professor of medicine and been doing research in diabetes and heart disease for a long time. And I'm really uh, happy to be here and happy to be presenting to you. I wanted to just let you know that we're gonna devote a fair amount of time at the end to questions and answers. So I would encourage everyone to go ahead and put in questions into the Q&A uh, section of Zoom. The chat function has been disabled, but Q&A, you can leave your questions and Lee and I will be discussing those uh, after we finish a brief introduction that gives you a summary of some information about uh, type 2 diabetes. So with that, I'm going to turn things back over to Leah and uh, let her introduce this topic and uh, give you her insights about how to live better with type 2 diabetes. So today, um, I wanted to briefly discuss about um, what is type 2 diabetes. I want to talk about the numbers that are associated that we kind of reference in diabetes. Um, so focusing on um, type 2 diabetes. So what does that really mean? So thinking about um, our bodies not using insulin properly. So insulin is a hormone, um, and that hormone really helps, as you can see in this diagram, um, let sugar into cells. So eating foods like carbohydrates and having sugar um, where we need it, which is in cells like muscle cells, so we can be active, our brain so we can think, is really where we want the sugar so it can be used. We don't necessarily want the glucose or the sugar um, going around in our bloodstream as much because um, that's where over time it can accumulate and get um, we can have higher blood sugars. So this is a concept called insulin resistant. When our cells are more resistant to absorbing the sugar, um, we call this insulin resistance. And so our channels that allow glucose to come in are not as effective. So what are the numbers? So everyone always wants to know, there's a, um, a number that people often ask 
Um, and it's the hemoglobin A1C number. So it's a 90 day average. And basically what this average is measuring is how much residual sugar is on your red blood cells. So how much are your red blood cells holding on to sugar and having sugar? So we can measure that. Um, it's a long-term measurement, so 90 days. Um, and we have some numbers where we really like to see people at. And the reason why we note these numbers is to reduce risk for complication. Um, so there are a lot of studies that have been done um, looking um, in particular with people who are living with type 2 diabetes, 7% or less. Um, hemoglobin A1C really minimizes um, risks for micro and macrovascular um, issues. So if we look at this, um, if your A1C is less than 5.7, um, we would consider that um, normal blood sugar. If we're thinking um, pre-diabetes, the 5.7 to 6.4 is that pre-diabetes category. And then diabetes is 6.5% or higher for the hemoglobin A1C. Um, and typically people will ask for two different tests. So sometimes people will have like a 6.5, but with lifestyle, change it and go back into a pre-diabetes state. So there, it's kind of a fluid number. Um, fasting blood sugar less than 100 is in the normal range. Um, 100 to 125 is in the pre-diabetes range and 126 and above is considered diabetes. Again, we need other numbers to really diagnose, but these are kind of ranges to look at. And then we also have an oral glucose tolerance test where people can drink 50 grams of glucose and we can measure blood sugar and see um, where they're at. Um, so I really wanted to get right in. So what can I do to improve my health? Um, so I think the thing that Dr. Stafford and I always talk about that's not celebrated enough is that sometimes maintaining your weight, the weight that you're at is a success. So I think we always like really try to push weight loss. Like if you're not losing weight, there's not success. Maintaining weight loss really is important. A lot of people go through their adult lives gaining weight. And if we can maintain weight, have a stable weight, that actually can be very beneficial. Now, of course, it's even more beneficial to go ahead and lose weight. And in fact, weight loss as little as 5% may actually make for some fairly significant metabolic changes. Yes, definitely. Um, so also a lot of people will think about um, macro um, percentages. So the perfect amount of carbohydrates, these um, macro percentages. Well, when we look at research, there's not a specific amount that you need to have. Everybody is different. Say you eat a vegetarian diet, potentially your carbohydrates may be higher than somebody who does not even eat a vegetarian diet. And that doesn't mean that it's not gonna work for you to help with your health and managing blood sugars. And then really, when we look at all of the research, what are the big takeaways? The big takeaways are thinking about focusing on nutrient dense foods. So foods that are colorful, foods that have lots of uh, vegetables, whole grains, things that you don't open a package um, that are processed, made from flowers. So focusing more on those nutrient de dense, unprocessed foods. Um, and then thinking about, like I had mentioned, eating a lot of vegetables. So I feel like um, non-starchy vegetables are the unsung heroes of everything, all these different chronic diseases, really focusing on um, how can we get more of those? How can we move our plate to look like more non-starchy vegetables than we had the day before for certain meals? Um, and then with that, adding in fiber. So as we add non-starchy vegetables, we also increase our fiber. And another thing I like to think about is when we're eating our food, if we look down at our plate, thinking about how can we identify the foods that we're eating? So um, are the foods as close to mother nature made them as possible? So if we look down, can we identify, hey, that's lettuce, those are tomatoes, or are we looking down at our plate and saying, oh, it's um, something that I'm not really sure what the ingredients are, is it more processed? Um, and then thinking about eating our non-starchy vegetables first. So this is something that's a little bit newer in the research, but thinking about having non-starchy vegetables before you in, um, intake your starches. So maybe a small side salad up front with your dinner versus at the end of the dinner or not at all. So having that um, non-starchy vegetable up front. 
And so kind of continuing on with this idea of what to eat. Um, so I, it, this has been studied extensively. So thinking about um, what is the best diet? That is the million dollar question. What is the best diet for diabetes? And really through all this research, the answer that we've come up with and researchers time and time again have come up with, there's no one diet. There's no one fad diet or specific diet that everybody needs to follow. Um, and I think that that's so, so interesting. But what really we need to think about um, is really how are we critical of the diet that diets that people are sending at us? So like maybe a diet like the ketogenic diet or um, the paleo diet, people that are saying are really good for maybe type two diabetes. Um, maybe looking at that with a really critical eye, I always think about. Um, because at the root of this, um, I don't never encourage people to adopt a diet that's not anything like the diet they're used to eating. For example, uh, at least for me, um, I still I really enjoy rice and rice is a staple food for me and my family. Um, and so I feel like um, telling someone to eliminate a staple food that they've always um, eaten is something that's not very sustainable, but working on ways to think about portions and think about timing of eating is something that I think is a better thing to think about. And then also, we do know that people, um, when they focus on eating more plant-based foods, those are always good um, for reducing um, blood sugar and then also keeping our bodies overall healthy because we also want to think about the health of our whole body, the health of our heart, um, our blood pressure when we're thinking about type 2 diabetes. So it's not just about the blood sugar, it's about our overall health. Um, so we really want to kind of look at that big picture and see what works best for us. And then the biggest key to the diet is really thinking about what's sustainable for you and your family. I think that's really important to think about. And then also really kind of shifting the mindset away from food as being a negative thing, like it raises my blood sugar, it increases my A1C, to food as more of a positive. We need to eat. Um, food is nourishing. Our bodies need food um, to think, to perform, um, to move and exercise and um, take care of our family. So food is actually very nourishing and kind of reframing that in our mind versus putting food as kind of the bad guy, the um, person who's um, maybe just raising our blood sugar, but food more nourishing. And then know that there's no one size fits all recommendation. Um, I think that you're definitely the expert in your own life. So really thinking about for you, where are the changes at the end of our presentation that maybe you can glean from and start making changes. There is a new thing that has kind of come up a little bit more, um, and the concept is called intermittent fasting. Um, but really, instead of focusing on kind of the more trendy name, what it really looks like is not eating over such a wide window. So maybe at night after work or after dinner, um, instead of watching TV or doing whatever you're doing and snacking, if your stomach and your body is not telling you that you're hungry, sometimes it becomes a habit where people just eat, but they're not eating when they're hungry. So they're not listening to their hunger cues. And that's what I want to glean from um, this new concept called intermittent fasting. So really letting your body not have input of food um, when it's not hungry. So maybe we're eating more for stress or our brain or other reasons. So really thinking about that. Because um, research has been showing that when we're not eating over such a long period of time, um, our insulin resistance can really reduce. So when the body's allowed to kind of go through more of a fasting period, um, our insulin resistance can um, be reduced, which I think is great. Um, and then just really focusing on if this is something that may be right for you. If you go and you're reaching for that normal snack, do a check-in with your body. Am I really hungry for this snack? Um, is this something that maybe I'm trying to eat for reasons like stress related or habit related, or is this true hunger? So just checking in with yourself. I also like this idea of maybe not eating after dinner if you're not hungry, because it cuts out with all this decision fatigue. We know that we're going to reduce insulin resistance by doing this. And finally, just thinking about um, moving our body. So this is really important as well. Um, and starting with wherever you're at. 
So if right now you're working at home um, and it's been hard to find time to be active, starting with something, maybe after a meal, 10 minutes and trying it out, see it for size, see if it works, see if it doesn't work and evaluate that. Um, but we really recommend getting to 150 minutes of activity per week. Once you hit that marker, I'd say push it and do more if you feel comfortable. Um, we're starting to research more about insulin resistance and resistance activity. So using your muscles, resistance bands, lights, weights, something that um, uses and engages your muscles because that cuts down on your insulin resistance. And then if you're at home or you're working a sedentary job, getting up and doing something, even stretching, holding a pose, using your muscles um, every 30 minutes, just getting out of your chair so you're not constantly sitting can also really help. And then finally, just um, kind of tie it in um, from this section, what can you really do um, to start right now. So when you leave tonight, hopefully you'll be full of um, excitement and thoughts about what you can do. Um, and we want you to be really smart about how you go about your goal. So I think sometimes um, big ideas like I want to uh, lose weight or I want to eat vegetables every day. We need to think about where are we at right now and where can we make a very specific goal. Start small, try it out for size, see how it goes. We can always build, always, always build. And these are things that we want to make changes for the longevity um, and sustainability of our life. So we don't want to do some like crash 30 day diet um, because we want the sustainability of what we change. So we want to make that specific. Um, when we make that goal, we want to make it really measurable. For dinner, I plan to um, not snack unless my body is telling me I'm hungry. So that is um, the end of my section. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Stafford. Um, and was, then we'll chat again later. That was really great, Leah. And I, I can't agree more with the last slide. Trying to set up realistic goals, ones that fit with your life and ones that prompt you to make small changes that you can sustain over time and build on those changes over time. Uh, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. So I'm going to continue the conversation to, to talk a little bit about kind of the primary care perspective. And I will reinforce just how important these issues of physical activity and diet are that, uh, that Leah has mentioned. And we can always come back to these within the question and answers. And again, I encourage you as you're listening to go ahead and type in your questions and uh, some of those we may answer uh, online, but I'm hoping that most of them will actually be able to uh, discuss uh, when Leah and I have our conversation. So um, what are the long-term consequences of type two diabetes? And these are really the reasons why we should be so concerned about diabetes and making sure that we're treating diabetes appropriately. You know, I think this is a list that many people know, but, you know, kidney disease, nerve damage, eye disease, uh, coronary disease, a particular type of heart disease where there are narrowing of the arteries that serve the heart muscle with oxygen and blood and uh, other artery blockage, especially the arteries going into the legs. So these are really important complications. And these are the reason why we should be so intent on trying to do our best to treat diabetes. And uh, diabetes treatment, as I think about it, really falls into two main areas. One is all those things we can do to try to control blood sugar. Now, we do have some really good drugs, and the best of these is called metformin. It really should be pretty much mandatory among anybody who can uh, take it um, because it's the drug that lowers blood sugar the most. There are a whole host of new drugs that are available adding to our uh, kind of our toolbox of the drugs we can use to try to lower blood sugar. But I want to make this, uh, and insulin, of course, is a long-standing treatment that now is routinely combined with some of these other medications. Now, I want to make this point, though, that medications really are not enough for good control of blood sugar and for a high quality of life. 
And the issue of blood sugar is really only part of the equation for diabetes treatment. The other part is managing cardiovascular risk. And this has to do with intensive treatment to control cholesterol or lipids and blood pressure. Um, statins are, are really important for people with diabetes. Um, blood pressure, keeping blood pressure well below 130 over 80 is another important goal. And often aspirin is used to prevent clotting. Now, these sort of issues relate to the fact that along with diabetes and the problems with blood sugar, diabetes is part of a whole range of other things going on in the body metabolically. And those things increase the risk of heart attacks. They increase the risk of clotting. Um, there's a lot of things that go wrong in the body beyond blood sugar. So just as we're focusing on blood sugar, we have to focus on these cardiovascular risks. Now, these drugs are important, but again, for cardiovascular risk management, it's really more important what the person does and how they live their life. And so I wanna make this point that in some ways, because heart disease is the most common cause of death and hospitalization for people with type two diabetes, we really need to focus on heart disease. And blood sugar is important, but in some ways, heart disease risk is even more important. And heart disease, again, is a problem because all these other things tend to come along with diabetes. And not all of these things can be offset or um, negated through using medications. So as important as medications are, they're really only part of the story and lifestyle and health behaviors really are the foundation of good diabetes treatment leading to good outcomes. So the first, I don't wanna go into a lot of detail because Lee has already covered this, but you know, when we think about physical activity, we often think about younger people. But in fact, the greatest benefits of physical activity or starting or increasing physical activity are for people who already have chronic disease. And diabetes is a good example of this. And I wanna make the point like, Lee, like Leah did that it's not just aerobic physical activity. We need to be thinking about strength training and isometric or balance training because as all of us get older, these issues become more and more important. So yes, it's important to keep the heart healthy, but it's also important to protect our bones and muscles and to protect ourselves from falling. You know, a healthy diet in diabetes, there are a lot of different takes on this. As Leah said, there's no one right answer, but in some ways a diet that's plant predominant where there are mostly vegetables and whole grains, some fruit, um, one where there's reduced saturated fats and no trans fats, um, avoiding sugar sweetened beverages and fruit juices, anything that is in liquid form of a sugar. And then, you know, beyond that, also minimizing other sources of sugar, including um, or starch, including processed carbohydrates. And then a, a healthy diet should be low in salt high in dietary fiber, and uh, should emphasize good plant oils. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this idea of high glycemic index. When we're talking about diabetes, what we want to put into the body are those foods that take a long time to digest. And as you can see in the graph here, you know, we have this idea that of glycemic index. And glycemic index is basically the idea of how quickly a particular food is converted over to blood sugar. So very high glycemic index foods are converted very rapidly and then leave the body rapidly. At the other end of the spectrum, low glycemic index foods basically take longer to get into the body and then they have their nutrition distributed over a much longer time. And so the high glycemic index 
foods or things we really want to be able to avoid. Uh, these are just things that are like sugar and get converted to sugar if they're not sugars already. And then medium glycemic index foods are things like whole wheat bread and brown rice. They still have lots of carbohydrates that get into the body relatively quickly, but just not as quickly as, as processed starch or sugar. And then the ideal type of food is something that has a low glycemic index, something that enters the body slowly, digests slowly, and then provides nutrition for the body for a very long period of time. And we know that high glycemic index carbohydrates are inflammatory. And in fact, inflammation is one of the problems within diabetes. So in some ways, this is just adding fuel to the fire of diabetes. Um, I'm not gonna take a long time on this, but just wanna point out that we really want to be able to reduce our intake of saturated fats and trans fats. Uh, these are fats that are both inflammatory. And what we would like to do is to focus more on unsaturated fats. And these are fats that have this prominent bend in them. This bend keeps them liquid at room temperature. And these are almost exclusively from plants. And then we also have the omega-3 fatty acids, which are a particular type of unsaturated fat that does seem to have some particular benefits. In terms of weight loss, Leah went over this, but just wanna mention that, you know, the first goal really should be weight stability. And that there are some substantial benefits, even with minimal weight loss, and that we don't necessarily need to return to the weight we were at age 20 that 5% may be enough to have these metabolic shifts. Um, central obesity, that's obesity that's within the belly is particularly important. And I, I do wanna make the point that for diabetes, there is the potential for partial reversal, especially early on in type two, type two diabetes. And in terms of prediabetes, that is this process of not metabolizing carbohydrates appropriately, um, this can be fully reversed often with weight loss and other health behaviors. So just to summarize here, you know, drugs to lower blood sugar are very important. And these drugs that help to reduce heart disease risk are also at least as important as those blood sugar lowering drugs. But what's more important are health behaviors. And this is where patients really can have a big uh, impact on their health outcomes and their quality of life. And this is really the key to living better with diabetes. And you know, it includes these things like physical activity, diet, sleep, and weight, um, but also making sure you take your medications stress reduction, limiting alcohol, and then also maintaining good social networks. So what we've provided here is a very quick summary of some of the keys that we believe are important in living better with uh, type two diabetes. We're very eager, however, to now turn it over to the audience and uh, answer some of the questions that you are entering in the Q&A. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and we'll uh, go back to just Leah and myself. So uh, Leah, I had one question that's, uh, that's a little bit left over, which is this idea of um, getting most of our nutrition through legumes, through beans and lentils. And I'm wondering if you could talk about kind of comparing beans and lentils as a food group to other food groups that we have out there, um, particularly meats there, which are, a, you know, a ample source of protein. So how do beans and legumes, lentils compare to meat? And then from the viewpoint of carbohydrates, how do they compare with things like rice, including, you know, both white rice and brown rice? What do you think? Yeah, great question. Definitely. I'm happy to take a stab at that. 
Um, so really thinking about um, legumes and so beans and lentils, things like that, they have protein in them. Um, and when we think about the protein, we like to think about complementary foods um, that make all the building blocks in our body to um, build muscle and uh, be utilized. And so um, beans aren't complete sources, not all of them um, of amino acids, but when we have them in a diet with a whole grains and things like that, they become complete. And so they're great sources. They're really high in fiber. Um, they're slower digesting. So if you take um, beans and you eat a bowl of beans versus a bowl of rice, your blood sugar is going to be lower with the beans. You're probably going to be more full because they're higher in fiber and slower digesting. So I think that's kind of also a really interesting thought to think about um, getting more plant-based foods. Maybe you have um, some vegetables, and you throw beans on top of it and you, you can do an experiment and you can see, well, how long do I stay full from this meal versus if I didn't add the beans? Or you could do an experiment and say, how long do I stay full from the, the, this meal with beans versus a meal with some chicken or fish? So you can see for your own body type what kind of works best for you. Um, thinking about eating um, rice versus beans, I think a lot of people like to sometimes cut or mix some of their rice with some beans. Like you can have um, brown rice and add some lentils into your brown rice um, because lentils have less carbohydrate per cup versus um, rice. And so it adds more fiber, more satiety, um, and a little bit less carbs, slower burning. Yeah. And I, I think that really kind of illustrates that the uh beans and lentils actually can be a really important mainstay of diet. And one of the, one of the participants, uh, you know, mentioned a particular person who basically eats just beans and seems to do okay. I do want to emphasize that, you know, there is a need over the long term to have a full complement of amino acids. And so it's probably important to have a more varied diet than just uh, legumes. Um, but they are a really important source of food. And of course, in many parts of the world, they are really the main source of, of protein rather than meat. So Leah, I had another uh, question here. You, you talked a little bit about intermittent fasting, which is a, a kind of, it's been around for a long time. I, uh, I recently did some reading on that to discover that, uh, but it's certainly become a fad lately. Uh -huh. uh, and to me, it does seem to have some really important benefits, almost as much from a behavioral point of view of kind of having people find an easier way to control their eating, uh, but also seems to have some metabolic benefits. Now, one of the questions we've gotten is, you know, what are some other fads out there in terms of diet that may not be so favorable that, uh, you know, we should think twice about implementing in our lives? Yeah, that's also a great question. So to kind of all put our lens on as clinical dietitians, in general, we say that diets that completely eliminate food groups um, tend to not be as healthy. For example, right now, the ketogenic diet is very popular. Um, and so this is a very, very high fat diet, moderate protein, very low carbohydrate diet. It actually um, first gained traction with research in children who had epileptic, epileptic seizures. Um, and we've also kind of found in research, um, it really can kind of lower and keep blood sugar a little bit more steady um, when they do research. The interesting thing, when you read the research, typically the research is done for shorter periods of time. Um, and when they follow people on the ketogenic diet for longer periods of time, like a year, um, typically they don't lose more weight, um, have any more benefits, um, sometimes less benefit than other people on like another diet, like a calorie restricted diet, so like lowering um, the amount of energy that you eat. So I think just looking at it with a critical lens, thinking, huh, have 
having to completely change everything I normally do about my diet tends to not be sustainable from a behavioral um, sort of standpoint. Um, and also when you think about a diet like the ketogenic diet, you really have to be really high fat, moderate protein, low carb. Um, and there's no, no kind of wiggle room. Like if you eat And I could just pick up a little bit here and say that, uh, you know, it's a diet that's hard to follow. There's no doubt yeah. about that. And that uh, I do worry a little bit uh, about kidney disease and the fact that a long-term uh, ketogenic diet may not have a very favorable profile when we're looking at kidney health. Um, but I do often... Um, tell people if they're interested that it may be a very effective way to kickstart other changes in diet. Um, in particular, having those very severe restrictions allows you to come out of that feeling like more choices are good and maybe you don't need to go back to, uh, you know, the diet you're, you're eating, which was, uh, you know, a relatively unhealthy diet. So I, I think there's some some interesting research on ketogenic diet, kind of ketogenic, ketogenic diets, uh, but it's not something I would ever recommend for longer than you know about a month at a time. Yeah, and I think it's also important to look at lipids um, because we are thinking too with diabetes, really protecting our hearts. Um, we really want to think about our um, cholesterol panel and where we start at, and um, if it's more elevated, it might also not be as good of an option. Mm -hmm. focusing more on plant forward um, diets and getting in that non-starchy vegetable is great for everything. And what do you think about a gluten-free diet for diabetes? Yeah, that's, um, that's also a great question. So um, I think that with gluten-free diet, so gluten is just the protein that's found in um, wheat-based products for the most part. Um, and so I think not always eliminating going gluten-free gives you a blood sugar benefit. Um, so when we really look at some of the gluten-free products, sometimes we see that they're a little bit more processed. Maybe they're derived from white rice. Um, or tapioca starches. So starches that are a little bit higher on the glycemic index that you had mentioned earlier. So it doesn't always necessarily mean that it's going to be healthier for your body. I think that if you do a gluten-free diet and you're focusing more on um, unprocessed foods as close to mother nature made them as possible without those wheat-based products, it can be a healthy option. But I think just focusing on a gluten-free diet doesn't give you a diabetes benefit. Yeah, you know, I, I, you know, in my in my own practice, uh, I often do note that people who go gluten free often substitute foods that probably are no less healthy or no more healthy. So uh, I think it's important if you're going to use a gluten free diet to use it for its benefit, which basically is putting off limits a whole range of foods that simply aren't very good for us because they have lots of wheat-based processed starches. Um, to really get the full benefit of a gluten-free diet, it's important that you're substituting vegetables and whole grains for the processed wheat that you're giving up. You know, we yeah, did have one question um, about what are the, you know, a lot of these health behaviors that we're talking about. Uh, these are things that all of us know. And all of us, of course, know that there are, you know, goals in our lives where sometimes it's easier to say things or to say we're going to do something than to actually follow through. And I think the, the audience member asked a really good question was, you know, a lot of people know what the right thing to do is, um, but it's really hard to get started. And um, I'm wondering, you know, what's your, your kind of advice to somebody who's just saying, you know, I, I know exactly what I should do and I know I should prioritize physical activity and changing a few things in my diet, but I just can't kind of get myself motivated. 
Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think it comes um, along often when I'm working with people in clinic um, and just people in general. So I think we know a lot of things that we could do. Um, but I would say in our brain, oftentimes we have all these ideas about um, maybe 10 things that we have to start yesterday. Um, and I think that I think Dr. Stafford and I today want to give you the permission to say, Maybe there are 10 things on my mind I think might benefit my health. Let me choose one of them. It doesn't have to be all 10. Maybe all 10 um, down the road would be beneficial to your health, um, but really focusing on one. And as you think about all the things that you want to do for your health, what is the one that you could start tonight or that you could start tomorrow? So what is that thing that has been on your mind that you're like, oh, I think if I order more, purchase more vegetables that are green or um, leafy that I'll start eating them. That's the one thing I want to focus on after hearing this talk. That is excellent. So starting there, once you build that into your lifestyle and get used to purchasing more non-starchy vegetables, go for that other thing. Hey, maybe I could stand up um, and go for a, a walk around my block at my lunch hour or after dinner. Um, so add that in as supplement. So it's kind of like an all la carte thing. Instead of thinking about all the goals, what you can do um, today, the one thing. So giving your permission to um, start there, I think is a really great um, thing to think about after today. And I think, what do you other, think? I think the other part of that is, uh, you know, recognizing that, you know, the doctor may have told you that there are all these important things. And, you know, I had eight main things on, on my list, taking one and taking the one that you think you can be successful with and really getting that down and, and making that part of your life is a really important process. And once you have some sense of comfort that you've made that change, then taking on number two, and sort of having these changes build on, on one another. Um, we had one question uh, from an audience member about a uh, wanting to have a little more discussion about this idea that often when we eat, it's, it's not because our body absolutely needs nutrition. And, and sometimes we eat for a whole host of other reasons beyond just you know, our nutritional needs in the moment. And I, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about kind of that idea of how we eat and how we might take better control of how we're eating. And particularly this question of how do we actually tell when we're hungry? Uh, one thing that I find interesting is that many people actually are um, confusing, their body confuses thirst with hunger. Can you talk a little bit about kind of that range of topics? Yeah, that's a great question um, as well. You all have wonderful um, questions that are really kind of getting um, really into a lot of big things that people ask me in clinic. So I think that we do eat for a lot of different reasons. And I think figuring out for yourself um, what your hunger looks like. Some people, um, when they actually notice they're hungry, they really feel it in their stomach. They, their body may have been giving them signals that they are hungry earlier. So really trying to identify yourself what hunger feels like um, a lot with a lot of people I work with, I like to think about um, asking yourself other things. Um, when was the last time I had water? Um, so am I thirsty? Um, when was the last time that I ate? Did I eat a couple hours ago? Um, thinking about what did I have? Is that something that was less filling or more filling? How am I on my stress? Do I feel stressed right now? Um, is that prompting me to want to kind of chew on something? Or am I working on a project? So really identifying um, what your hunger signals are and sort of figuring that out for yourself and kind of asking yourself that question. Um, there's kind, kind of also an idea called the hunger scale. So if you think about a ruler, um, sort of rating your hunger um, based on the ruler. So where you're at. Typically at meals, you actually want to be in the middle. 
You don't want to be super ravenous. So you don't want to let your body get super, super hungry. Um, also, you don't want to already be full when you're eating. So you want to be in the middle because if you eat when you're super, super hungry, um, typically the body tells your brain that you're full after maybe like 20, 25 minutes and you can um, overeat and end up very full at the end of that meal. So eating in the middle, I think is a great place to be. So there's a, another interesting question here about this issue of reversibility. And, uh, you know, I think there's a, a way in which our mindset around diabetes from the healthcare system basically is taking it as a given that once people develop diabetes, it's going to be there. Um, the fact is that if people undertake some changes in their lifestyle, there is a certain degree to which diabetes can be reversed. And this is particularly true early on. Now, some of the, the strategies for doing that begin to, to feel very difficult for some people, particularly losing weight, becoming much more physically active, um, changing their diet considerably, getting better sleep. But cumulatively, taking on those sort of changes in health behavior does provide some possibility of reversal. And of course, the, the medical community really hasn't taken that point of view. Um, and I think that part of what's going on here is that, you know, we do rely on these medications and we sort of put those front and center putting these health behavior issues a little in the background. Um, but there is some growing um, consensus that, that if we really want to deal with diabetes, we should think about prevention during, while people are, are developing prediabetes. And then also, even if people develop diabetes, to really use this idea of, of reversal. Now that's not gonna be possible in, in all cases, particularly people who have had longstanding diabetes for decades. Um, but there are a range in which even they can reverse some of the metabolic damage of diabetes. Um, but again, our medical system tends not to focus on this idea of reversal and basically allows people to, uh, in some ways, get away with not having to think very heavily about these health behaviors. And I think we do need to, you know, kind of have these health behaviors be part and parcel with good diabetes care. Any, any comments about this idea of reversal? Yeah, I'm so glad that you um, bring that up as well. So I think that relying on medications, if you look at all, they always say, along with lifestyle management, so diet and exercise. And I think that it's fine print, but we need to bold that print. Because um, when we're thinking about our bodies and our heart health and all these other things that we want to um, keep healthy, the diet has so much benefit um, for all of these things. And so even if we take a medication and our blood sugar is lower, um, but we're eating fast food every day, something that really promotes more inflammation in our body, then our body is not going to be as healthy as if we started making these lifestyle changes. It doesn't have to be all at once, like we talked about earlier. It could really just be ordering more vegetables. Um, if you order takeout, getting some steamed veggies on the side from the restaurant, putting it in your basket, having your family choose um, extra veggies, how they want to eat them. So they get, they don't go bad and they get eaten. So these little things starting, um, really lay the foundation for better blood sugar, but also more heart health, um, and better blood pressure management. You know, and I want to just reinforce that idea, particularly diet and physical activity. These are health behaviors that affect so many different organ systems and so many different chronic diseases. And uh, they should be part of diabetes um, management and they do help improve diabetes outcomes. But in some ways, you're getting multiple benefits by taking on these two particular health behaviors. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in fact, I think we underestimate 
how important these types of health behaviors are. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's not, these aren't easy. Um, Leah and I are not suggesting that we can just sort of focus on these things and make these changes readily. They are difficult. And that one does need to understand that health behavior change is a process. It's not like flipping on a switch. It's going to be difficult. And there may be times when there's backsliding. Uh, but on the other hand, the health benefits over a huge range of, of health issues is very, uh, these, these health behaviors are very impactful. And I should say that more and more is understood that some of this benefit may be from this idea of systemic inflammation, that if we do things that are anti-inflammatory, such as physical activity and eating vegetables and sleeping better, reducing our weight, that these can have an effect on some of the reasons why diabetes developed in the first place. That is this inflammatory type of picture, um, not just on the, the fact that diabetes is present and we need to treat it. So uh, I think these are, are really key issues. Um, Leah, what would you say about certain um, dietary supplements for diabetes? You know, I know of, of several supplements that are purported to reduce blood sugar. Um, in my own practice, I, I feel like I don't know enough about those to, to really say very strongly one way or the other. But, you know, I think it's important that any person, whether they're a clinician or a patient, take a, a really good look at the evidence that's available available uh, to support any particular type of strategy. Yeah, that's also a really great question. Um, there definitely are some supplements um, on the market that are kind of touted to lower insulin resistance, that thing we talked about in the very beginning of this lecture. Um, like, and I would say that when we're going down the route of supplements, um, I sometimes sort of pause because supplements are not as well regulated um, as medications, um, yet they actually can have like a very um, large impact on things like blood sugar sometimes. Um, but it's hard to always know the research with um, like dose by dose or brand by brand. Um, so sometimes I'm a little bit less confident in that. Um, I tend to sort of more, more err on the side of exercise um, and diet. Cause I think this really hits home the point that we're trying to make when we're thinking about um, lifestyle management, having a lot of benefit for our heart and our blood pressure um, and our overall health and our inflammation versus taking a pill, whether it be a supplement or a medication pill. Um, I think that it is better to start these lifestyle management changes like exercise and eating more vegetables, eating more fiber, um, eating more plant forward meals, I think buy you more benefit than what supplements can do. Um, just because there's a wide variety of supplements, you can get some that are more certified. I know that I have some patients who will take them. Um, it's just hard to say, like even um, supplement by supplement, brand by brand, like which to recommend. Um, so I typically more recommend lifestyle management. Yeah, great. Thanks. That, I very much agree with that, that approach. I think in some ways it's a it's an area where we need a lot more research. And unfortunately, the level of evidence sometimes just is not significant enough to really allow one to judge whether this is good or, or not good. Um, yeah. you know, one question I uh, that came up around um, my last slide where I talked about limiting alcohol. Um, you know, alcohol has this mythology around it that a limited amount, particularly red wine, is beneficial. Um, studies over the last really 30 years have done a lot to discredit that sort of viewpoint. And uh, generally, I recommend that people limit alcohol um, substantially, particularly if they have chronic diseases such as diabetes. So I think it's important to realize that as a society, we were very attracted to this idea that alcohol might have some benefits. 
And in fact, it does increase HDL cholesterol, which is a good thing, but it also has a lot of other negatives associated with it. And, uh, you know, I think the United States, like many other countries around the world, will be going to guidelines which suggest that, you know, people take in no more than seven drinks per week. Um, and this is whether you're man or woman. Um, so I think that people should maybe think a little bit about questioning their, their use of alcohol, particularly if it's based on this assumption that uh, alcohol is going to be have a have a health benefit. What what do you say to people about alcohol, Leah? Yeah, I think um, I mean I I definitely agree with you as well. Um, I think definitely never starting to drink um, based on the perceived health benefit is never a recommendation. Um, I mean I think that. Um, if people are drinking like very moderate amounts, um, kind of focusing on that, but really not doing something that's multiple drinks in one sitting or one night is, is something that's definitely very health beneficial. So not doing that. Mm -hmm. I think um, really exploring the way, if you're used to drinking often, exploring, um, like why, why you're drinking, the reasons why. So is it a perceived health benefit or is it a social benefit or, or why? And kind of um, nail that in for yourself and kind of figure out and see if that's a, way, a goal that you could think about reducing. Very good. So I think we're just about at our time limit here. I really enjoyed this conversation with you, Leah, and uh, I'm so glad that we've had uh, people from the audience uh, typing in their questions. And uh, it's been really great to, uh, to talk about this. I just wanna make a, you know, a final kind of plea for people taking seriously these health behaviors. They really are the most important key to living better with type two diabetes. And uh, you know, these are not easy. In some ways, taking a pill or even an injection has a, has a simplicity to it that's not as complicated as health behavior change. But health behavior change, as hard as it is, is worth the effort. And I, uh, I think that both Leah and I very much agree with this and uh, think that you know, we as a, as a healthcare system ought to be emphasizing these sort of strategies uh, much more than we do right now. Any last words, uh, Leah? Yeah, I definitely um, also echo that. I think um, even if you start health, but, um, a health change and you add more non-starchy vegetables like we talked about today into your diet and your next hemoglobin A1C is not drastically more different, know that through that change, you've affected your heart, um, your inflammation, you probably affected your blood pressure on average. Um, and you might see, need to take a little bit of time to see that A1C kind of come down since it is a really 90 day average. So I, I would say don't get discouraged. So if you're making these healthy changes that we talked about today, um, just really know in your heart that you're doing um, wonderful things for your body and for your health. So we really support you on that. And I think we're going to hear from Nora at this point. Thank you again for joining us this evening. It's been really wonderful to have you uh, join us for this, uh, this session. Thank you. Thank you both for such a really lively and um, wonderful discussion about really um, significant healthy behaviors that uh, we can all approach just one little step at a time. Um, mm -hmm. Something as simple as picking up some more leafy vegetables and trying to find a way to get them into our diet or getting up and taking a walk around the block. All things that are within reach, but um, we just need to draw a little attention to it. So this was a terrific evening, really enjoyed it. And thank you again for taking the time for the audience to join us. And thank you, Dr. Stafford and Leah. This was a wonderful discussion about really practical ways that we can address living better with type two diabetes. So good night, everyone. And thanks again.